Welcome to this Unit 5 video lecture. In this lecture, we will take a look at the events after the Battle of Marathon, when the Athenians scored a stunning upset victory over the Persian Empire. And of course, Marathon will only be the first round in an ever-escalating round of tensions that will result in the invasion of Greece by Great King Xerxes. Now, in previous units, we have looked at the development of the Persian Empire and the Persian kings of the Achaemenid dynasty, beginning, of course, with Cyrus II, Cyrus the Great, who founds the empire. And we see his son, Cambyses, bringing Egypt into the empire. And we've just finished looking at King Darius and the failed strike against Athens in an attempt to punish Athens for its involvement in the Ionian Revolt. And so we left off at the Battle of Marathon in 490 BCE. We pick up our story with Darius's attempt to get revenge against the Athenians for that humiliation at Marathon. But as events unfold, Darius will not be able to get revenge, and that task will be left to his son Xerxes, who will become king in 486 BCE. So it's going to be Xerxes who we will be following in the next series of lectures when we examine a massive invasion of Greece by the enormous Persian military force. We last left off with the Greeks believing that perhaps Marathon would end the conflict between Greek and Persian, and that maybe the Persians have been taught a lesson. But, of course, that is not how things work with an imperial power. Athens cannot be allowed to stand as an example of defiance. Such an example, if unpunished, could give the satrapies, uh, the provinces of the Persian Empire, the motivation to revolt. So shortly after he gets word of the defeat of his forces at Marathon, Darius begins to put together a larger and more extensive invasion expedition that he plans on launching against Greece but he will be prevented from carrying out this invasion when he dies in 486 BCE. The son of Darius, Xerxes, now becomes king, and Xerxes had every intention of picking up where his father had left off. He felt it was important to avenge the loss of Persian honor, and he decided that he would launch an invasion to punish the Athenians. This initial attempt is frustrated, though, when immediately after Darius dies, two of the satrapies, or the provinces of the Persian Empire, Egypt and Babylon, go into open revolt. And it takes some time for the new king to quell these rebellions. Here it is important to note that Xerxes is the first of the great kings to come to the throne without having lived the kind of vigorous and active military campaigning lifestyle of his predecessors. When we look at Cyrus and Cambyses and Darius, these were all men who had been forged in the crucible of combat. Xerxes, by contrast, grew up at the royal court, surrounded by luxury, so he's out of touch with the reality of conflict. And the Greek historian Herodotus tells us that initially Xerxes expresses some hesitation as to whether or not to go through with the invasion. And uh, there is this debate that goes on between Xerxes' two key advisors, uh, both older relatives of his. One of these advisors, Mardonius, uh, tells Xerxes that he must go through with this invasion in order to avenge Persian honor. And by the way, remember, it is your duty to expand the holdings of the Persian Empire. That is the duty of every king. The other one of the advisors, Artabanos, urges caution and reminds Xerxes that his father's uh, ill-fated attempt to conquer the Scythians uh, resulted in a setback for the Persian Empire. So there's some back and forth uh, as both men try to influence Xerxes, 
who ultimately decides to go ahead with the invasion. Now, I should point out that after Marathon, many of the Athenians uh, will be confirmed in their assumption that Athenian military power should always be based on the hoplite phalanx. And this, of course, will be the attitude of those men who fought at Marathon. And uh, you see here on this slide uh, a mound called the Soros, which is located at Marathon itself. And it is the burial mound that contains the remains of those Greeks who fell in that battle. And this attitude will become a strategic problem uh, when you take into account that uh, the Persians have a massive naval fleet at their disposal, uh, and they fully intend to bring it with them. And what will happen if the Greeks don't have enough naval assets to somehow contend with the Persian navy? I mean, as you can see, uh, Greece is nothing but coastline, so that will allow the Persians to pick and choose landing areas. Now, fortunately for the Greeks, an Athenian named Themistocles had the foresight to anticipate the nature of the threat of a Persian land and sea invasion of the Greek mainland. But taking measures to defeat that threat are going to be a domestic political challenge because, again, many Athenians are complacent and the hoplite class doesn't want to think about investing in a naval expansion. Well, Themistocles, not only does he have foresight, but he also has considerable political skills. He is adamant about expanding Athenian strategic capabilities, and he is crafty enough to ultimately steer Athens on a course of naval power that will be the basis for Athenian power for the next hundred years. But it won't be an easy task. Now, in an extraordinary turn of good fortune, in 483 BCE, three years before Xerxes launches his invasion of Greece, the Athenians strike a very rich vein of silver in the state mines of Laurium, located near Athens. It is estimated uh, that this uh, silver strike had a value of 100 talents, which was the ancient equivalent of roughly $100 million in more or less modern money. Now, normal procedure for such a windfall would be to mine the silver and divide the spoils equally among the citizens of Athens. But Themistocles, the proponent of a naval expansion, suggests that Athens use the wealth to expand its fleet of triremes. Now, Themistocles will be opposed by a guy named Aristides, who was from the upper middle class, and he was one of those guys who was rather complacent and felt that hoplites can handle any emergency. And so there is this debate between the two, and ultimately Themistocles is able to gain the support of the poorest group of Athenians. You may remember the lowest of the four wealth categories of Solon's um, reimagining of Athenian society, uh, the group called the Thetes. And the Thetes were the most numerous of the Athenian citizens, and they could vote in the assembly. And after hearing the debate, they vote in favor of Themistocles' proposal to use the silver to expand the Athenian fleet. And Themistocles will gain their support by reminding them that if at least a uh, hundred ships are built, laborers will be needed for the construction. Wages will have to be paid. After the ships are launched, rowers will be needed to crew these ships. These rowers will be paid a wage. So the Thetes vote for their long-term economic interest. And at the same time, they put Athens on a new strategic trajectory, the pursuit of naval dominance in the Aegean. The type of ships that will be built are called triremes, 
and they are called this trireme because they rely on three uh, banks of rowers to propel the ship. Uh, the primary weapon of a trireme is the ram on the front of the ship. And the idea was that with these rowers rowing in unison, you would build up enough speed to either shear off the oars of your opponent's ship or puncture the hull of your opponent's ship below the waterline uh, with the ram and cause it to sink. But this required a great deal of teamwork, every bit as much teamwork as you might imagine that a Greek phalanx needed to maintain its cohesion on the battlefield. Over time, the Athenians will become renowned as masters of the sea. But this is that moment where Athens, thanks to Themistocles and the Thetes, is turning away from land power and towards the sea. This is going to be a gradual process, but we are now at that founding moment.